Hi, I'm Eric Vanman. Oh, I'm Will. <laughs> and we are here to talk to you today about our recent tour of the United States to visit a bunch of colleges and universities where Will might go to school one day. Will is right now in his year 11 of his high school at, in Australia here. And in the autumn of the United States in 2024, he hopes to commence going to college or to a university there in the United States. Um, so we were just now visiting these colleges as potential places for him to go to and mainly because he's never seen any of them before in, in person and it was just nicer to see them in person than just to look at them on the web. And so we thought we'd go ahead and share with you some of our impressions and some of our video footage from our trip. So we should talk a little bit about why you want to choose the United States to go to college. You want to say something about that, Will? Yeah, so um, Australia doesn't have um, what a lot of US universities do, which is um, a liberal arts curriculum. And a liberal arts curriculum I would say, I'll define it as the freedom to choose pretty much whatever you want and to really set your own path. So what that might look like is that you might, for the first two years of university, you can pretty much shop around for classes. Um, you can take classes in whatever you want and you really only have to decide your major or multiple majors or multiple minors until the end of your sophomore year. So you really have lots of freedom to explore um, interdisciplinary and also um, explore different fields and, and different teachers and different aspects of all of the university pretty much. Yeah, so the places that we chose to look at are all places that have a liberal arts curriculum but they vary in lots of different features in that um, some are small, some of them are large, some of them are um, places that have graduate students, some of them don't have graduate students, some of them are urban, some of them are rural. So we really wanted to get a good sampling of different kinds of colleges and universities. And we ended up visiting 20 uh, colleges and universities on this trip. And we took tours at 14 or 13 of them. And so what we're going to do today is just talk to you about 14 of them in depth, the ones that we know the best. But there were another six that we also stop by and took a look at them, but we're not going to really talk about them very much because we don't think it would be fair to go into those ones in as much detail. Now the smallest college that we visited was Pomona College, which has about 1,700 students, and the largest places that we looked at were NYU and UCLA that have 28,000 and 32,000 undergraduates respectively. Most of these are private universities and colleges, so that means that um, they cost a lot more. The average tuition was somewhere between $60,000 and $80,000 per year. Um, so they're not you know, heavily subsidized by the public, by the state uh, coffers or anything like that. So they are quite expensive. Um, the one notable exception to this was UCLA, which is a, a state university, one of the flagship universities of the state of California. Note too that in the United States, when you hear something called a college, this usually means that it has undergraduates only. Um, so it just focuses primarily only on undergraduate education. Something that's called a university means that it has not only the undergraduate uh, education, but it also has postgraduate, like in law or medicine or doing a PhD. Some of these universities even had more um, postgraduate students than they did undergraduate students. So that kind of makes a difference then when you're looking at these different uh, places. Two other quick things to mention. So Will did mention this liberal arts curriculum. Um, we should say that a lot of the the, how each college or university handles the liberal arts curriculum varies. Some of them are very open-ended, like they have a um, like a very open curriculum for you to pick classes in all sorts of different topics, different fields at their college during those first couple of years you're at their college. But other places have more what are called like distribution requirements, where they might have like six primary areas or three primary areas, and you have to take a certain number of classes in each of those areas as part of your liberal arts training before you focus more on the major itself. And so these colleges that we're visiting here differ on this, on, in terms of this sort of spectrum of how open they are about your choices, and we'll mention some of the key ones as we talk about them. The other thing I'll just mention is the financial aid. So when you hear that the colleges cost somewhere between sixty and eighty thousand dollars a year in U.S. money, and some of them even more than that when you count all the additional costs, um, you might say, "Who in the world can afford to go to college like that?" Well, the fact is, the places that we were looking at are some of the most select and some of the richest universities and colleges in the country, and therefore they have the money, the, the endowment, to help students go to their colleges 
cost-free. And so in fact, almost all of these colleges are uh, need blind, which means that when you're applying there, they don't have any idea how much money your parents make, how much money you might have in your personal fortune. Um, you get admitted, and then independently of that, you're also assessed for financial aid. And basically, these kind of colleges that we're looking at are places where if your parents don't have enough income to, or, or assets to contribute towards your education, the college or the university will make up the difference. And some places it can even be up to 100%. Um, I think it was Princeton, was it? That yes. just yeah. What tell us about Princeton? So Princeton um, uh, has just recently announced that all students whose um, total family income is below a hundred thousand gets one hundred percent tuition paid. So all your expenses, all the tuition, all the dining, all the meals and stuff, everything is pretty much free. If I wouldn't worry about not being able to afford it. Um, these places if you're considering applying because a lot of these places are happy to give out lots of support and money to help you pay for tuition. Yeah, so again, considering any one of these colleges to apply to for your personal experience, you should think about it without regard of the, finan of the finances, how much it would cost because more often than not, way far more often than not, the university or the college is going to come up with a financial aid package to make it fine with you. And you won't have to have any loans, you won't have any debt when you finish. Um, we're talking about the fact that they just give you like fifty, sixty thousand dollars right off the top of their price tag um, in order to make it affordable for you. And they can do that because they have these very large endowments that are loaded with cash and um, they can help out. Our first stop, which was just a couple of hours after landing in New York after our 24 hour journey from Australia, was Princeton, New Jersey. Princeton is a small to medium-sized private university. It has 54 undergrads and 5,000 postgraduates. It's a member of the Ivy League. In fact, the tour guide at Princeton boasted that Princeton has more Ivy growing on its buildings than any other member of the Ivy League. As of October 2021, they've had 75 Nobel laureates, 16 Fields medalists, and 16 Turing Award laureates that have been affiliated with Princeton, either as alumni, faculty members, or as researchers. They've also had two US presidents, 12 US Supreme Court justices, three of whom are currently serving on the court, and numerous living industry and media tycoons and foreign heads of state are all counted among the Princeton alumni body. Given its prestige, it also has one of the smallest admission rates in the country. Only 4% of the applicants are admitted. Princeton has one of the best student to faculty ratios of the schools that we visited, five to one. So that means that for every professor, there are only five students. And that would also mean that most of the classes of Princeton are small, like 10 to 15 students in a class with a professor. Just to give you some context, we saw a photo of the 2022 graduating class in psychology, and there were only 35 students in the picture. At my university, which is a large public university here in Australia, we graduate several hundred students each year in psychology. Now the Princeton campus is gorgeous, as you can see here. It's huge too, at 600 acres. We put on a lot of steps that day, didn't we, Will? Yeah. <laughs> um, students at Princeton live in residential colleges for most of their years, and they can join eating clubs when they're upperclassmen. Princeton boasts 38 majors and 54 minors, with most of their departments ranked in the top five in the country. One key feature that we liked about Princeton is what's called the Novogratz Bridge Year Program. If you're accepted to Princeton, you can opt to delay your studies on campus for one year and work tuition-free on a community engagement program in Bolivia, China, India, Indonesia, or Senegal. And after completing that year, you can come back to campus and then do your next four years at Princeton like any other student. So it was an excellent way to get students involved in service right out of high school. What other impressions did you have about Princeton, Will? Yeah, so um, first of all, as you can see in all these uh, videos, Princeton is a very beautiful campus. You kind of feel like you're in some kind of medieval castle, just how much, um, you know, old brick buildings are just around everywhere. It's, it's very pretty. Um, definitely the advantage of Princeton is that pretty much every single department is top of its class. Um, Albert Einstein was actually uh, a part of the faculty there. Um, at, but you can definitely tell that um, <laughs> Princeton is a leader um, worldwide of 
top departments. Um, what I liked about Princeton is that it is a very lovely college town. It's only a one hour train ride away from uh, New York and Philadelphia, and there's a train station right on campus. So, very easy access to, um, you know, great American cities from such a intimate college town. I also really enjoyed the fact that um, students at Princeton have to complete what's called a senior thesis, which means in their senior year they have to write a, a large thesis. Um, the standard is probably about 80 pages, and you get lots of guidance um, doing a thesis. At the end of the time when you've completed your thesis, um, Princeton actually publishes your thesis for you and you own your own material. So leaving Princeton, you're going to have actual academic contribution to the field you're going to want to study, which will give you definitely advantages if you want to pursue post-grad post or any other opportunities like that. And I will say that the tour guide was very fun. Um, Princeton, I really enjoyed the fact that Princeton had lots of um, student organizations. I think it has about five, over 500, which is insane for such a small college. But definitely, you are not going to get bored at Princeton. You're going to have lots of fun while also studying at some of the best apartments in the world. Now, on our second day, we had a tour of NYU in the morning. NYU is a private, research-intensive university with 28,000 undergrads, but also has another 24,000 postgraduate students. Yet the university boasts a 9 to 1 student to faculty ratio. There are plenty of small classes here, but you're more likely to have introductory courses that probably have like 100 to 300 students in them than you might have at a smaller college. It has a 13% acceptance rate. The facilities are first rate, with many older buildings beautifully restored and other buildings representing the finest in contemporary architecture. They currently have five Nobel laureates on their faculty, 18 MacArthur Fellowship Genius Grant recipients. They have more than 270 majors and minors, and their business school, their film school, and several other departments are among the very best in the country. So, Will, you weren't overwhelmed with the size of NYU, were you? No, not at all, because you can't really tell where NYU begins and where it starts because you are at the heart of Manhattan. That, that's the main advantage of NYU is that you are literally in New York, which is arguably, you know, one of the biggest and most significant cities in the entire world. And so, yeah, um, it didn't really feel that overwhelming because you couldn't really tell where the students were because you've got all these New Yorkers all around you, all the taxis, all the all the tourists, every, you know, it's the hustle bustle of New York. So that's definitely the biggest advantage. And with that, you've got all the opportunities of New York City. You have all the, uh, the fun nightlife, um, all the fun, because, you know, it's New York. Um, it's got lots of cultural opportunities. And I will say, though, the disadvantages of NYU is that um, housing, uh, Obviously, it's in New York, which is one of the most expensive cities in the world, so housing um, apparently is not guaranteed all four years. Um, and so it can be a problem at times, and our tour guide did mention that. And also, NYU is a very large university, so you're probably not going to have the same level of intimacy with your professors as some other smaller colleges. But with that, you are going to have lots of resources at your disposal, the entire city, so yeah. Now in the afternoon after visiting NYU, we made our way to the Upper West Side of Manhattan to visit Columbia University. Columbia was our second Ivy League school. As of December 2021, its alumni, faculty, and staff have included seven founding fathers of the U.S., including Alexander Hamilton, four U.S. presidents, ten justices of the U.S. Supreme Court, 99 Nobel laureates, 33 Academy Award winners, and 125 Pulitzer Prize recipients. In fact, it's the home of the Pulitzer Prize. It has more than 6,000 undergraduate students and 24,000 postgraduate students. It also boasts a smaller student to faculty ratio, but that exact figure is currently being revised due to some controversy in how it was originally calculated. Only 6% of applicants are admitted. The campus is relatively small. It's largely centered around a large open space where students gather to hang out in the sunshine, 
watch the tourists go by, maybe enjoy a concert. Most students live in residence halls on campus, but the university also owns over 7,800 apartments in the surrounding Morningside Heights neighborhood. I believe this was the only tour where we got to see an actual dining hall. Given its physical size, it felt like students were everywhere you turned, which gave me a slightly crowded feeling that I didn't necessarily have when we were at NYU that morning. Columbia has more than 100 programs of study, and again, most of its departments are in the top five in their field. Research is very strong and important here, and students have plenty of opportunities to get involved with it. Columbia students, like NYU students, have New York City at their doorstep, which provides all sorts of opportunities for education and entertainment. Our guide told us how she took a course in art history, and the professor took them to the Metropolitan Museum of Art to see those paintings in person. That's a perk of going to Columbia. What are the other impressions did you have of our tour there? Yeah, so um, I'd say that Columbia arguably has the most iconic architecture of any university in the world. So um, coming with that, it's got definitely lots of prestige. However, I would say though, um, as my dad mentioned, there was a controversy with Columbia where um, previously um, on the US World News Report, which is the main ranking of colleges in the United States, um, Columbia was around 5th or 6th, I can't really remember, we'll probably put it up on screen, um, but um, a professor at Columbia actually exposed that Columbia was lying about lots of its statistics, so it's actually been bumped down to around 19th um, in the US. And with that, I'll definitely say that Columbia uh, feels kind of elitist. Um, although the tour guide was very nice, I did kind of get, you know, that snobby aroma um, and since Columbia is such a large focus on postgraduates there's not going to be as much focus on the undergrads and compared to NYU I didn't actually like the, the campus that much because it kind of felt claustrophobic because it's only got about three blocks um, in Manhattan and so it tries to use the most out of that space so you've got really tall buildings it kind of feels like you're walled in so, yeah, it was definitely a, a very different vibe in person than compared with videos, but I might have mentioned all these disadvantages, but Columbia is definitely a very top, very top university. It definitely has very good departments. Now, on our third day, we took a two-hour train ride from Grand Central Station to New Haven, Connecticut to visit Yale University. Yale was founded in 1701, and it's the third oldest college or university in the United States. It's a member of the Ivy League, too. It's smaller than NYU or Columbia, with 5,000 undergraduate students and 7,300 postgraduates. Yale boasts five U.S. presidents and 10 founding fathers as alumni, but it also has 31 living billionaires as graduates. As of October 2020, 65 Nobel laureates and five field medalists have been affiliated with Yale. So in short, this is one of the very top universities in the world. It also has a very low acceptance rate of 5% as a result. They have a 6 to 1 student-faculty ratio with about 80% of their classes having fewer than 15 students. We took both an official tour of Yale and then a private tour with a family friend who's currently a senior at Yale. Some of the highlights of Yale include its unique residential college system, which where 400 to 500 students live in one of 14 residential colleges for most of their time at Yale. Residential colleges include having a dean who provides advice about classes and career, and who also writes to your professors on your behalf when you're too ill, for example, to complete an assignment. There's also a head of college who lives in a house on the college grounds with his or her family, and who's responsible for overseeing the academic affairs for the students of the college. I think Will and I were really impressed by everything at Yale, including the architecture, the beautiful grounds, the magnificent libraries, and just the overall quality of the place. Yeah, definitely. Um, like my dad said, Yale is one of the top universities, and being there in person, you can definitely tell why. Um, the architecture, the, the campus, it, it felt grounded, it felt distinguished, it felt very, um, it felt very scholarly, it felt very, uh, and um, Yale actually boasts the second largest collection of books in the entire United States, second to the Library of Congress. 
So you can definitely tell that they've got lots of resources, lots of great facilities, and I really liked the housing system that my dad mentioned. Um, it makes sure that your time at Yale, when you're initially there as a freshman, you won't feel outcast. And that was definitely reassured by um, by talking to the family friend. Shout out to Monique if you're watching this, um, <laughs> um, who assured me that um, Yale despite having kind of a stereotype of being competitive, it was actually a collaborative environment and you're definitely going to find other very bright students who are eager to learn and you're, you're going to have friendships that are going to last a long time there, yeah. On day four of our trip, we drove a couple of hours out of New York into Connecticut to the more rural setting of Wesleyan University, which is in Middletown. Wesleyan was our first small college. It has just 3,000 students, with only 200 of those being postgraduates. It is private, and sometimes it gets grouped together with Williams and Amherst colleges as the Little Ivies. Wesleyan has had four Nobel laureates associated with it and has many noted alumni, including Joss Whedon, Matthew Weiner, Amanda Palmer, and Lynn manuel Miranda, who wrote his first musical, In the Heights, when he was a sophomore at Wesleyan, and he debuted it there. Wesleyan is a research university receiving big government grants, but most of that research is conducted by the undergraduate students working with professors. It has a 19% acceptance rate and an 8 to 1 student to faculty ratio. Again, classes are small here. A large class might have 30 students or so, but it's quite common to have fewer than 10 in your class. Wesleyan has few requirements and likes to tout its open curriculum, which means that you do have to complete a certain number of classes for your major, but which classes those are and which electives you take is totally up to you. In addition, the students are guaranteed housing all four years, but it follows a progressive independence model. In your first year, you live in a dorm, but in the second, you live in an apartment-like setting. In your third year, it's more like group living, but by your fourth year, you can share a university-owned house with your friends and do your own cooking if you don't want to buy a meal plan at the college. You get the feeling that Wesleyan really encourages students to learn to take charge of their own lives. Yeah, definitely. Um, Wesleyan, at the info session, Wesleyan made a big um, emphasis on allowing students to grow their skills of being independent because, you know, fresh out of high school and into university, they really aim to not, educa not just educate you academically, but educate you holistically in um, in becoming an independent adult when you when you leave Wesleyan and although that might not be everyone's cup of tea because that means you're gonna have lots of uh, personal choice and responsibility and I can definitely say that myself I definitely find making decisions very hard but luckily Wesleyan does have lots of resources there to help you like a supervisor and one of the other things I, I liked about Wesleyan is that um, it really had a deep emphasis on community engagement and service learning and so it often partners with Middletown, uh, the city it's in, to do lots of projects um, and Wesleyan also boasts a very impressive theatre and music scene. Um, obviously, as my dad said, Lin-Manuel Lin Miranda did go there and uh, created In the Heights so obviously um, you're gonna have lots of great theatre um, there if you're into that and yeah say so overall I liked I liked the vibe <laughs> alright now on day six of our trip we toured Northeastern University in Boston Northeastern is a medium-sized private research university with its main campus in an urban setting it has 19,000 undergraduates and 8,500 postgraduates its acceptance rate is 18 percent and it has a 15 to 1 student to faculty ratio it also has its share of Nobel Prize laureates and other scholars. What it's probably best known for is its cooperative education program, more commonly known as the Co-op, which integrates classroom learning with professional experience among 3,100 global partners. These are six-month placements that are tuition-free and in fact are supported by pay or a scholarship from Northeastern. You can do up to three of these while you're a student, but you're not required to do any of them. This means that you could graduate from Northeastern with real-world experience on your resume in addition to all your formal coursework. It has more than 270 majors, 
but it also features combined majors, allow you more freedom to design your studies yourself. Most undergraduate students choose to live on campus, but third years and above can opt to move to off campus if they want. Yeah, so the biggest advantage of Northeastern is definitely its large internship program. And especially with how hard the job market is nowadays, Northeastern is definitely geared to those who want to leave the university with a good basis to jump out into their career from. Um, so you could be leaving Northeastern with internships from the UN, Apple, Google, um, lots of big companies. And you're not just doing, they made sure to emphasize that you're not just doing, um, you know, pouring coffee for the, for the boss. Um, you are actually doing and learning together in the job with um, whoever the company is you're working for and you are going to learn these experiences that you can apply once you leave um, Northeastern and so that is definitely the main advantage of Northeastern and the facility is also very nice. In the afternoon that day we visited Tufts uh, which is in the suburbs of Medford and Somerville not far from central Boston. Tufts is also a research university but it's about a third of the size of Northeastern with 5,800 undergraduates and 5,700 postgraduates. Its student to faculty ratio is 10 to 1 and it has 11 percent acceptance rate. Its average class size is 20. It's known for its focus on international affairs, study abroad programs, and promoting active citizenship and public service across lots of different disciplines. Tufts boasts 10 Nobel laureates among its affiliates and plenty of governors and U.S. Senators and Emmy and Academy Award winners have gone there. Students can choose to live in one of 25 residence halls, which includes several small special interest houses, or they can share an apartment. Even students who live off campus are just a five to 10 minute walk away from their classes. Tufts offers over 90 undergraduate programs. They can also study at the School of Museum of Fine Arts, which is one of the leading art schools in the nation and is affiliated with the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Yeah, so coming off um, what my dad said, Tufts has a very quirky repu reputation in that the students are very diverse, the, um, the student body is very interested in arts but also politics and, and stuff like that and so um, with that they've got lots of cool traditions like um, there's a cannon in the middle of campus that people just started painting and so groups and uh, many of the student organizations that Tufts has, which are many, come and paint the, paint the cannon with whatever message they want to communicate, which I, I find pretty, pretty cool. And yeah, Tufts is in the center of Boston. It will soon have a link to the T, and so you're going to have easy access into Boston. And yeah, Tufts is pretty cool, yeah. <laughs> now the next day we drove two hours west of Boston to Amherst, Massachusetts, which is home, of course, to Amherst College. You'll recall that Amherst is one of the Little Ivies. It has just 1,971 students, with an entering class of about 450 students each year, and then a 9% acceptance rate. This gives it a small student-to-faculty ratio of 7 to 1, with most of its classes less than 20 students. In fact, they have many student classes that are even less than 8. Um, among its alumni and affiliates are six Nobel laureates, numerous Pulitzer Prize winners, a president of the United States, Calvin Coolidge, Emmy, Grammy, and Academy Award winners, and even the author David Foster Wallace, who wrote The Infinite Jest. Students write a senior thesis in their major, which often gets turned into a student's major publication, as it was for David Foster Wallace. One of the cool things about Amherst is that it's part of the Five College Consortium, which are five colleges and universities around Amherst that share their dining halls, sport facilities, and their curriculum. About 50% of Amherst students take courses through the consortium, which means that over 6,000 courses are available to students each year. Amherst herself offers 41 fields of study and 805 courses, and it has an open curriculum, which means that students are not required to study a core curriculum or fulfill any distribution requirements, and they may even design their own unique interdisciplinary major. Amherst has 34 residential colleges, seven of which are reserved for first-year students. After their first year, you're no longer required to live on campus, but most students continue to do so. 
Yeah, so, um, Amherst is part of what's known as the Five College Consortium, which is a collection of five di var varying uh, universities in the region. And so, with that, um, Amherst has the advantages of, you know, an undergraduate college, but it also has access to um, one of the top state universities, the University of Massachusetts, as well as several other leading colleges. And so, it really has kind of the best of both worlds if you're looking for an emphasis on undergraduate education, but also all the opportunities that come with um, a large research university or... So, um, Amherst has a very beautiful uh, campus. It overlooks some very pretty mountains. It is home to some leading departments, such as the Department of Mathematics, and my tour guide seems very excited um, in her major about math, and so it seems like um, if you're going to go to Amherst, you are going to have very excited students and very eager faculty who are willing to involve you in lots of different opportunities um, and great teaching. Now, on that day that we left Amherst, we then drove another two hours to the northwest corner of Massachusetts, where Williams College is located in Williamstown. Williams and Amherst are actually close rivals, having very similar sizes, and they're often considered as the number one or, and number two small liberal arts colleges in the U.S. Williams is situated in a picturesque valley surrounded by the Berkshire Mountains. It's probably the most isolated college that we visited in the sense that the nearest cities are a few hours away. Williams has 1,926 students and a 9% acceptance rate, and a nearly identical student-to-faculty ratio of 7 to 1, as does Amherst. The campus is beautiful and the facilities again were first rate. Our guide was highly enthusiastic about her experiences there. One thing that she emphasized was this Williams tradition of tutorials, which involved just two students and a professor meeting every week for the semester of the topic being covered. For example, one student might be assigned to write a paper about the week's topic, and then they send the paper to the other student who provides a critique of the paper while the professor moderates the discussion and then they swap roles for the next week's class. Again, most of these classes are small, although one can encounter the occasional large class with like maybe 50 or 100 students. Will and I spent a couple of hours meeting with two psychology professors while we were there, and they really hit home the fact that they love to teach and that they stay very engaged with their students. In fact, our guide told us that you can invite a professor to a three-course dinner at the faculty dining hall, and Williams will pay the bill. You can get coffee vouchers as a student to take a professor out for a coffee. The remoteness of Williams might be a concern for some people, but we were reassured that students have many ways to spend their free time with perhaps one of their most popular clubs, the Outing Club, uh, available to take you hiking and camping in the surrounding mountains. And I think you actually like that whole idea of being outdoors a lot there. Yeah, you definitely um, really get integrated into the surrounding environment and you're, you're going to enjoy lots of nature. But with that, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword because you're very isolated, you're not very close to any big cities. But with that, it's actually kind of an advantage because the professors who are going to be there are going to be really eager to teach you. Because, you know, professors aren't going to move out to the middle of nowhere unless they really want to. Um, and I definitely got that sense talking to the two professors. So that's really a positive of um, Williams, especially with those Oxford-style tutorials where you're going to be one-on-one -on -one with your professor um, learning some very interesting content. And so, if that's the thing for you, I would recommend Williams. Now on day eight of our trip, we drove two and a half hours west into the state of New York to Hamilton College, which is in the town of Clinton. Hamilton is regularly listed as one of the best liberal arts colleges in the country, and it's similar in size to Amherst and Williams. It has 1,900 students and a student-to-faculty ratio of 9 to 1. Its acceptance rate is 14%. It also has an open curriculum like Amherst, which means that you can pretty much design your own major if you don't want to follow a more traditional curriculum. Hamilton also provides about 130 research stipends to students each summer, which allows them to work with a faculty mentor on a research project. Hamilton has 43 majors available, with some of the most popular being economics, mathematics, government, world politics, biology, and psychology. 37% of the classes have 9 or fewer students, and 76% have fewer than 20. Again, 
This campus, as you can see, is beautiful with a nice mixture of 19th century buildings and modern architecture. And again, it is kind of in the middle of nowhere, but um, the tour guide assured me that students definitely get very involved, for example, in sports. I'm not sure if, it, if this is a bit biased because the tour guide was the captain of the basketball team, but um, uh, students, even if they're not involved in sports, uh, get in and are very engaged uh, with supporting their friends who do sports. And so, for example, one of their funny traditions they do is um, once a year they play a game against one of their rivals and uh, they throw orange peels onto the ice hockey rink. And so that's kind of a funny tradition. And the school actually tried to stop that by banning mandarins uh, the week of that game. But the, they always manage to sneak in some orange, oranges to throw at the other team, which I thought was a pretty funny tradition. They also had this really fantastic diner where we oh, had. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah um, it's kind of funny. A lot of these colleges, um, I kind of find it funny because I'm Australian, but a lot of these colleges love to emphasize food. Um, it's like one of the things they mention after academics. It's, oh yeah, top GPA, best food. <laughs> um, <laughs> and definitely Hamilton did uh, was a solid contender because they have lots of food options, including a 1960s style diner, which s sold very good mac and cheese. Well, after having this great lunch at the diner on the Hamilton College campus, we then drove a few hours west to Ithaca, New York, to visit Cornell. Now, Cornell didn't have any tours available that day, so Will and I spent an hour or so on our own exploring the campus. Cornell is another Ivy League institution with 25,000 students, with about 15,000 of those being undergraduates. It has a 9% acceptance rate and a student to faculty ratio of 9 to 1. Cornell is one of the leading research universities in the world, and its achievements of its students and faculty are extraordinary, with 61 Nobel laureates, four Turing Award winners, and one Fields Medalist being affiliated with Cornell. It even has 35 alumni who became billionaires. Some of its alumni include E.B. White, author of Charlotte's Web, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Anthony Fauci, and Bill Nye, the science guy. The campus itself is huge. It covers 2,300 acres, and certainly it was the largest campus that we visited on this trip. Several of the university buildings are listed as historic landmarks. Many of the departments are their best in their field. There are many housing options, including freshman residence halls, as well as sorority and fraternity houses. We have to assume that the classes again here are on the smaller side, but perhaps they would be larger than they were at like at Hamilton or Amherst or Williams. Yeah, the campus was definitely very gorgeous. I mean, quite literally, there was a gorge running through the middle <laughs> with a dam and a waterfall and lots of crazy stuff. Um, it's right on a hill and it overlooks uh, all of Ithaca, so it's, it's definitely very pretty. Um, I will say though, it does feel very big. Um, I guess if that's your thing, that's great, but I kind, of I kind of found it a bit intimidating. But I mean, you are at Cornell and Cornell definitely has the reputation of having a, a cult following, including Andy from The Office. Um, so a lot of alumni that we've spoken to uh, love Cornell a lot. So even though it might be big and imposing, uh, you're definitely going to find a community that you're going to bond with. Now from Cornell, we drove past Buffalo, New York, and we briefly stopped at Niagara Falls one morning. And then we went on to Cleveland, Ohio, going another 30 minutes to the small town of Oberlin, home of Oberlin College and the Conservatory of Music. Oberlin is the oldest co-educational liberal arts college in the U.S., being the first to admit African Americans in 1835 and the first to admit women in 1837. Oberlin was also one of the stops on the Underground Railroad as former slaves escaped from the South on their way north to Canada. Oberlin has 2,800 students with a 11 to 1 student to faculty ratio. Their acceptance rate is 34%. 80% of the classes have fewer than 20 students. A key feature of Oberlin is that it also has that conservatory of music, which has its own admissions process. A student can apply to be just a student in the conservatory, or they could just apply to be in the college, 
or they could be enrolled in both as are about 200 students right now who do that. The college offers 40 majors, minors, and concentrations. It's graduated four Nobel laureates and seven Pulitzer Prize winners. Some of their notable alumni include Roger Sperry, who later did research on split brain patients, Thornton Wilder, the playwright and novelist, Lena Dunham, who created the HBO series Girls, and William Goldman, the novelist who wrote The Princess Bride. Music is a big part of the campus life, whether you're enrolled in the con or not. There's also a big emphasis on sustainability and the environment. Oberlin has one of the largest college art museums in the country, and each academic year, they allow students to borrow original drawings and paintings by people like Renoir, Warhol, Dali, and Picasso for just $5 each semester to hang in their dorm rooms. Apparently, none of these pieces of art have ever been damaged in the 80 years that the program's been going on. Now, you really liked Oberlin, didn't you? Oh, yeah, it's definitely very artsy. Very progressive. I mean, as my dad said, it's always been historically on the forward of every movement in America, so it's definitely very progressive, and that's probably because of all the arts and uh, music there. And with that, um, Oberlin definitely has a strong emphasis on music. So, for example, they have a disco club where student uh, ensembles in the con or not in the con perform and play. Um, even Lizzo has performed there and ran a workshop with flautists uh, before she got big, so that's pretty cool. Oberlin has over 500 music events per year, which is around three a day, which is crazy. Um, so you're definitely going to have lots of fun at Oberlin. You're going to get very engaged with the student body. Um, and it also has very good access to Cleveland, um, which is known for its theatre scene. And so if you're going to go to Oberlin, you're going to get very involved in arts, um, very involved in music, very involved in theatre, and you're going to get a very tight-knit community of students around you. And yeah, uh, with that, um, as my dad mentioned, you can do a dual degree with the conservatory where um, it takes you five years or maybe even four years if you try hard enough to complete both a major in a music and also a major in um, a degree from the College of Arts and Sciences. So you can pursue your passion while also um, pursue your interest in music. Now, a few days later, we were in Chicago and we got a tour of the University of Chicago. The information session that preceded that tour was probably the largest one we had seen in our two weeks. Probably 100 students and, and family members were there. Our tour had about 15 people on it, and our guide enthusiastically showed us around the campus. The University of Chicago is private, and for all intents and purposes, it's just like any of the Ivies, except that it's in the Midwest. It has 7,500 undergraduates and 11,000 postgraduates. Its acceptance rate is only 6%, and it offers a student-to-faculty ratio of 5 to 1. Indeed, most of the courses, again, top out at no more than 20 students per class. The university's students, faculty, and staff include 94 Nobel laureates, among the highest of any university in the world. After the tour, we spent a few hours with one of the top neuroscientists at the University of Chicago, who has an impressive record of publications, top papers, grants in the field. He clearly told us how much he really enjoyed teaching at the University of Chicago. So I think you can safely assume that you will actually get these top professors teaching your class rather than maybe that they would be hiding away in their laboratory, protected from teaching. No, I think they're really going to be there engaging with the student. The university itself is on 217 acres in the Chicago neighborhoods of Hyde Park and Woodlawn on the south side of Chicago. This is not one of the safest parts of Chicago, but it seems that you'll be safe enough if you keep your wits about you and stay aware of your surroundings when you leave the campus. Yeah, so you Chicago, um, it is in the heart of um, Chicago. Uh, it, and it does have lots of green space and areas, so it does feel like you're in a proper college campus, unlike other urban universities like Columbia or NYU. It also has t some of the top departments in the world, uh, especially for economics. And with that, I'd like to mention that the professor we visited placed a lot of emphasis on the diversity of um, people there. So, for example, uh, you have the U Chicago Economics Department, which is 
um, home to eco economists like Milton Friedman, who is very uh, conservative, while also Yushikago boasts uh, a very strong sociology department, which is also very progressive. And so you're going to have lots of different opinions and ideas if you go there. And I guess that's an advantage if you're um, into that kind of thing. And yeah, UChicago is a very pretty campus. I'm sure you'll find uh, your place at UChicago. Now, after we left the University of Chicago, we flew out to California, and the next day in California, we made it to Eastern Los Angeles to Claremont, California, where Pomona College is located. This was our last tour, and it was probably one of the best. Our guide was knowledgeable, enthusiastic, and she shared lots of stories about her personal experiences at Pomona. And then this was followed up with a 40-minute information session in the admissions office. Again, Pomona is private, and it was the smallest college that we visited with just 1,777 students. It often competes with Williams and Amherst as the best private liberal arts college in the country, and thus its admissions are very selective. It again has a very low acceptance rate of 7%, and it has a 7 to 1 student to faculty ratio. The classes here are small, with many having fewer than 10 students in each class. 58% of the students engage in research with faculty while they're there. Our tour guide had a paper that was just accepted in a top physics journal that reported research that she had just conducted during her junior year. Pomona has another advantage in that it's part of the Claremont Colleges, which is a consortium of five colleges that share their curriculum, their dining halls, their sporting facilities, and even their main library. Like Amherst then, a Pomona College student can choose from a much larger range of courses, like over 2,700 courses, than is just offered at their own college. Unlike Amherst and its five college consortium, however, the other colleges at Claremont are so close by each other that you can just walk a couple of blocks to get to another college. Pomona's weather is also very nice and the mountains just above Claremont mean that in the winter you might ski in the morning and then drive to one of the Los Angeles beaches in the afternoon. Students live on campus in one of 16 residence halls and there are special initiatives for first year students there, such as taking a trip with a small number of students before classes begin, maybe to the mountains or to go rock climbing, and also being assigned to what's called a sponsor group of 15 students or so who live with you in your residence hall and become sort of like your family uh, when you get to college. Mm. Yeah, so I'm an Aussie. I love the sunshine. And that's one of the, one of the appealing things about Pomona is that you're in LA. You're going to have permanent sunshine all year round. Um, as opposed to um, occasionally some depressing winters if you go to uh, a college up north. And since it is in LA, you're going to have access to lots of um, opportunities. LA is a big cultural hub. I also just want to mention that really cool art building that we saw. They have a studio art building that they've just built a few years ago that just only is a place where people can do visual arts and it was really amazing architecture and then they also had a theater school so they within their own campus they're really good for entertainment and the arts and for music yeah. um, as well as being able to go off into Los Angeles and seeing all those. It is California and so a lot of the students are Californians so it kind of had a very chill atmosphere. Uh, the tour guide was very very good. Um, she, she shared lots of personal stories so for example She's actually doing a double major in physics and history, which seems like very different areas with not much overlap. It kind of resonated with me that she, you know, she sought help from all of her teachers, from her supervisors, and she didn't think of going into physics and history when she came into Pomona. But by the end of it, you know, she's got a top paper in the American uh, Physics Journal, uh, as well as doing a thesis in history and so I kind of felt that appealing that um, the staff uh, staff there are eager to support you in finding uh, passions that you might not have thought about before and I guess that kind of speaks to uh, how well the liberal arts curriculum can be for you in crafting a holistic and interdisciplinary approach and a broad range of skills that are going to leave you prepared for life. Well, that's pretty much our, our in-depth coverage of these 14 colleges. We also did see 
Brown University, Boston College. We drove by Boston University. We spent some time at Harvard. We went to Northwestern University in Chicago, and we also went to UCLA for a couple hours one afternoon. But we can't really speak very much about any of those places because we didn't really get to spend the time to get in depth with them and take a tour, for example. So we'll instead just show you their videos here as we keep talking. I'll just ask Will, um, so overall now that you've seen all these colleges, you've visited like up to 20 schools here, mm -hmm. do you have any favorites among the 20? So I would say that my favorites so far, I guess I've kind of sorted it into categories more than like a, a ranking. So for example, I thought Princeton and Yale were my favorite uh, big Ivy League um, prestigious universities because I really liked both of their atmospheres and it seemed like the students there seemed engaging but also collaborative um, as opposed to, you know, other uh, stereotypically competitive schools like Harvard. And both of their campuses were really good. Like, I liked Princeton's medieval castles and Yale's um, environmental sustainability building was actually very cool. I really enjoyed Williams, Oberlin, and Wesleyan uh, out of the liberal arts colleges because I liked all three of their atmospheres. Um, Oberlin had a very strong art scene. I really liked the intimacy and rigorous teaching at Williams and how uh, just the quality of teaching there and I also really enjoyed the um, holistic education at Wesleyan. I also really enjoyed Pomona because of the atmosphere, the vibe, it was very Californian, <laughs> it felt very chill. It definitely had a lot of the advantages of other colleges. But yeah, I'll say those, what was that? Six? Colleges. Also, U Chicago was very nice as well. Um, but I'll say those, yeah, those colleges I've mentioned were definitely the most outstanding and memorable colleges. Uh, no offense to the other colleges, I still think they're very good. Um, unfortunately, I think Columbia was probably my least favorite. But you know what? No offense to Columbia. I still love you. You're still one of the best universities in the world. Um, I know def definitely it was very hard, especially for me, an international student, to really get to know the differences between a lot of these colleges, like especially those liberal arts college, those small liberal arts colleges. You can't really tell immediately what their major differences are, but I guess this trip, it kind of helped solidify my understanding of colleges. Yeah. And so keep in mind that Will will be applying for these colleges in about a year. So it could be another 18 months before we actually know where he ends up going. <laughs> um, and, but I think your strategy would probably be to apply to like a large number of these colleges and then wait to see which ones admit him based on the fact that many of these places have very low admittance rates and we really don't know which colleges are going to take them. So it better increase our chances by applying to more colleges. But that's all we have for now, and hope that you enjoy the rest of the footage that we have of these other colleges. And stay tuned and subscribe to this channel if you find this really interesting and helpful. Thanks. Bye. Bye.